the jealousy of the powerful, how it had said. Arrakis, Dune, Desert Planet. Paul fell asleep to the dream of an Iraqi cavern. Silent people all around him moving in the dim light of glow globes. It was solemn there like a cathedral as he listened to a faint sound. The drip, drip, drip of water. Even while he remained in the dream, Paul knew he would remember it upon awakening. He always remembered the dreams that were predictions. The dream faded. Paul awoke to feel himself in the warmth of his bed, thinking, thinking, this world of Castle Caladan, without player companions his own age, did not deserve sadness and farewell. Dr. Yuet, his teacher, had hinted that the Fafraluch's class system was not rigidly guarded in Arrakis. The planet sheltered people who lived at the desert edge without Cater Bashar to command them. Well of the sand, people called Fremen, marked down on no consensus of the Imperial Gate. Arrakis, Dune, Desert Planet. Paul sensed his own tensions, decided to practice one of the mind-body lessons his mother had taught him. Three quick breaths triggered the responses. He fell into the floating awareness, focusing the consciousness, aortal dilation, avoiding the unfocused mechanism of consciousness, to be conscious by choice. Blood enriched and swift flooding the overload regions. One does not obtain food safety freedom by instinct alone. Animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment, nor into the idea that its victims may become extinct. The animal destroys and does not produce. Animal pleasures remain close to sensation levels and avoid the perceptual. The human requires a background grid through which you see to see his universe. Focused consciousness by choice, this forms her grid. Bodily integrity follows a nerve blood flow according to the deepest awareness of cell needs. All things, cells, and beings are impermanent, strive for flow permanence within. Over and over within Paul's floating awareness, the lesson rolled. When Don touched Paul's window cell with yellow light, he sensed it through closed eyelids, opened them, hearing the renewed bustle and hurry in the castle. Seeing the familiar patterned beings of his bedroom ceiling, the hall door opened and his mother peered in, hair like shaded bronze held with the black ribbon of the crown. Her oval face, emotionless and green eyes, staring solemnly. You're awake, she said. Did you sleep well? Yes. He studied the tallness of her, saw the hint of tension in her shoulders as she chose clothing for him from the closet racks. Another might have missed the tension, but he had trained it. But she had trained him in the Bene Gesserit way, in the minutiae of observation. She turned holding a semi formal jacket for him, carried the red Atreides hawk crust above the breast pocket. Hurry and dress, she said. Reverend Mother is waiting. I dreamed of her once, Paul said. Who is she? She was my teacher at the Benny Gesserit School. Now she's the Emperor's truthsayer. And Paul, she hesitated. You must tell her about your dreams. I will. Is she the reason we got Arrakis? We did not get Arrakis. Jessica flicked dust from a pair of trousers, on them with the jacket on the dressing stand beside his bed. Don't keep the Reverend Mother waiting. Paul sat up, hugged at his knees. Well, to come, Jabbar. Again, the training she had given him exposed her almost invisible hesitation. A nervous betrayal, he felt as fear. Jessica crossed to the window, flung wide the draperies, stared across the river torches towards Mount Subi. You'll learn about the come, Jabbar, soon enough. He heard the fear in her voice and wondered at it. Jessica spoke without turning. Reverend Mother is waiting in my morning room. Please hurry. The Reverend Mother guy is Helen Mohayim, sat in a tapestry chair watching Mother and Son approach. Windows on each side of her overlooked the curving southern bend of the river and the green farmlands of the Atreides family holding. But the Reverend Mother ignored the view. She was feeling rage this morning, more than a little petulant. She blamed it on space travel in association with that abominable space.
embracing guilt in its secretive ways. But here was a mission that required personal attention from a Bene Gesserit with this sight. Even the Padishah Empress Truthsayer couldn't evade that responsibility when the duty came. Damn that Jessica, the Reverend Mother thought. If only she'd born us a girl as she was ordered to. Jessica stopped three paces from the chair, dropped a small curtsy, a gentle flick of the left hand along the line of her skirt. Paul gave the short bow as dancing master had taught the one used when in doubt of another station. The nuances of Paul's greeting were not lost on the Reverend Mother. She said, He's a cautious one, Jessica. Jessica's hand went to Paul's shoulder, tightened there. For a heartbeat, fear pulsed through her palm. Then she had herself under control. Thus he has been taught your reverence. What does she fear, Paul wondered. The old woman studied Paul in one gestalt and flicker, face oval like Jessica but strong bones, hair. The duke's black black but with that brow line of maternal grandfather who cannot be named that thin, disdainful nose, shape of directly staring green eyes, like the old duke, the paternal grandfather who is dead. Now there was a man who appreciated the power of Prefera. Even in death, the reverend mother thought. Teaching is one thing, she said. The basic ingredient is another. We shall see. The old eyes darted a hard glance at Jessica. Leave us. I enjoin you to practice the meditation of peace. Jessica took her hand from Paul's shoulder. Your reverence, I... Jessica, you know what must be done. Paul look at, at, looked up at his mother, puzzled. Jessica straightened. Yes, of course. Paul looked back at the reverend mother. Politeness and his mother's oblivious, obvious awe of this old woman argued caution. Yet... He felt an angry apprehension at the fear he sensed radiating for her as mother. Paul, Jessica took a deep breath, this test you're about to receive. It's important to me. Test, he looked up at her. Remember that you're a duke's son, Jessica said. She whirled and strode from the room in a dry swishing of her skirt. The door closed solidly behind her. Paul faced the old woman, holding anger in check. Does one dismiss the Lady Jessica as though she were a serving wench? A smile flicked the corners of the wrinkled old mouth. The Lady Jessica was my serving wench, lad. For fourteen years at school, she nodded. And a good one, too. Now you come here. The command whipped out at him. Paul found himself obeying before he could think about it. Using the voice on me, he thought. He stopped at her gesture, standing beside her knees. See this, she asked. From the folds of her gown, she lifted a green metal cube about fifteen centimeters on a side. She turned it and Paul saw that one side was open, black and oddly frightening. No light penetrated that open blackness. Put your right hand in the box, she said. Fear shot through Paul. He started to back away, but the old woman said, this is how you obey your mother. He looked up into the bird bright eyes, slowly, feeling the compulsions and unable to inhibit them. Paul put his hand into the box. He felt first a sense of cold as the blackness closed around his hand, then slick metal against his fingers and a prickling as though his hand were asleep. A predatory look filled the old woman's features. She lifted her right hand away from the box and poised it close to the side of Paul's neck. He saw a glint of metal there and started to turn toward. Stop, she snapped. Using the voice again, he swung his attention back to her face. I hold at your, knee, at your neck the calm Jabbar, she said. The calm Jabbar, the high-handed enemy. It's a needle with a drop of poison on its tip. Ah, uh ah, -uh. don't pull away or you'll feel that poison. Paul tried to swallow in a dry throat. He could not take his attention from the seamed old face, the glistening eyes, the 
things to be poisoned in your food. The quick ones and the slow ones and the ones in between. Here's a new one for you. The Gom Jabbar. It kills only animals. Pride overcame Paul's fear. You dare suggest the Duke's son is an animal, he demanded. Let us say I suggest you may be human, she said. Steady, I warn you not to try jerking away. I am old, but my hand can drive this needle into your neck before you escape me. Who are you? he whispered. How did you trick my mother into leaving me alone with you? Are you from the Harkonnens? The Harkonnens? Bless us, no. Now, be silent. A dry finger touched his neck, and he stilled the involuntary urge to leap away. Good, she said. You passed the first test. Now, here's the way of the rest of it. If you withdraw your hand from the box, you die. This is the only rule. Keep your hand in the box and live. Withdraw it and die. Paul took a deep breath to still his trembling. If I call out, there will be servants on you in seconds and you'll die. Servants will not pass your mother who stands guard outside that door. Depend on it. Your mother survived this test. Now it's your turn. Be honored. We seldom administer this to men children. Curiosity reduced Paul's fear to manageable level. He heard truth in the old woman's voice, no denying it. If his mother stood guard out there, if this were truly a test, and whatever it was, he knew himself caught in it, trapped by that hand at his neck at the Gomjabar. He recalled the response from the litany against fear as his mother had taught him out of the Bene Gesserit right. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear is gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. He felt calmness return, said, Get on with the old woman. Old woman, she snapped. You've got courage and that can't be denied. Well, we shall see, Sarah. She bent close, lowered her voice to almost a whisper. You will feel pain in the sand within the box. Pain. But withdraw the hand and I'll touch your neck with my conchabar. The death so swift. It's like the fall of the headsman's axe. Withdraw your hand and the conchabar takes you. Understand what's in the box. Pain. He felt increased tingling in his hand. Pressed his lips tightly together. How could this be a test, he wondered. The tingling became an itch. The old woman said, You've heard of animals chewing up a leg to escape a trap. There's an animal kind of trick. A human would remain in the trap, endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. The itch became the faintest burning. Why are you doing this, he demanded. And you're determined if you're human. Be silent. Paul clenched his left hand into a fist as the burning sensation increased in the other hand. It mounted slowly. Heat upon heat. Upon heat. Upon heat. He felt the fingernails of his free hand biting the palm. He tried to flex the fingers of the burning hand but couldn't move them. It burns, he whispered. Silence. Pain throbbed up his arm. Sweat stood out on his forehead. Every fiber cried out to withdraw the hand from that burning pit. But the Gomchabar. Without turning his head, he tried to move his eyes to see that terrible needle poised behind his neck. He sensed that he was breathing and gasped, tried to slow his breaths and couldn't. Pain. His world, emptied of everything except that hand, immersed in agony. The ancient faces inches away, staring at him. His lips were so dry that he had difficulty separating them. The burning, the burning. He thought he could feel skin curling back, black on that agonized hand, the flesh crisping and dropping away until only charred bones remained. It stopped. As the switch had been turned off, the pain stopped. Paul felt his right arm trembling, felt sweat bathing his body. Enough, the old woman muttered. Kulwahad, the woman-child, ever withstood that much. I must have wanted you 
to fail. She leaned back, withdrawing the comb chabar from the side of his neck. Take your hand from the box, young human, and look at it. He fought down an aching shiver, stared at the lightless void where his hand seemed to remain of its own volition. Memory of pain inhibited every movement. Reason told him that he would withdraw a blackened stump from that box. Do it, she snapped. He jerked his hand from the box, stared at it astonished. Not a mark, no sign of agony on the flesh. He held up the hand, turned it, flexed the fingers. Pain by nerve induction. Can't go around maiming potential humans. There are those who would give a pretty penny for the secrets of this box, though. She slipped it into the folds of her gown. But the pain, he said. Pain, she sniffed. A human can override any nerve in the body. Paul felt his left hand aching. Uncurled the clenched fingers. Looked at the four bloody marks where fingernails had bitten his palm. Dropped the hand to his side and looked at the old woman. You did that to my mother once. Ever since so hand through a screen, she asked. The tangential slash of her question shocked his mind into a higher awareness. Sand through a screen, he nodded. We Benny Gesserit sift people to find the humans. He lifted his right hand, willing the memory of the pain. And that's all there is to it. Pain. I observed you in pain, lad. Pain is merely the axis of the test. Your mother's told you about our ways of observing. I see the signs of her teachings in you. Our test is crisis in observation. It's true. Here the confirmation in her voice said, It's truth. She stared at him. He senses truth. Could he be the one? Could he truly be the one? She extinguished the excitement, reminding herself, Hope clouds observation. You know when people believe what they say, she said. I know it. The harmonics of ability confirmed by repeated tests were in his voice. She heard them, said, Perhaps you are the Kwisad Zadarak. Sit down, little brother, you're at my feet. I prefer to stand. Your mother sat at my feet once. I'm not your mother. You hate us a little, huh? She looked towards the door, called out, Jessica. The door flew open and Jessica stood there staring hard-eyed into the room. Hardness melted from her as she saw a ball. She managed a faint smile. Jessica, have you ever stopped hating me? The old woman asked. I both love you and hate you, Jessica said. The hate, that's from the pains I must never forget. The love, that's just the basic fact, the old woman said, but her voice was gentle. You may come in now, but remain silent. Close that door and mind it that no one interrupts us. Jessica stepped into the room, closed the door, and stood with her back to the door. My son lives, she thought. My son lives and is human. I knew he was, but he lives. Now I can go on living. The door felt hard and real against her back. Everything in the room was immediate, pressing against her senses. My son lives. Paul looked at his mother. She told the truth. He wanted to get away alone and think this experience through, but he knew he could not leave until he was dismissed. The old woman had gained a power over him. They spoke truth. His mother had undergone this test, and there must be terrible purpose in it. The pain and fear had been terrible. He understood terrible purposes. They drove against all odds. They were their own necessity. Paul felt that he had been infected with terrible purpose. He did not know yet what the terrible purpose was. Someday, lad, the old woman said, you too may have to stand outside a door like that. It takes a measure of doing. Paul looked down at the hand that had known pain, then up to the reverend mother. The sound of her voice had contained a difference then from any other voice in his experience. The words were outlined in brilliance. There was an edge to them. He felt that any question he might ask her would bring an answer that could lift him out of his flesh world into something greater. Why do you test for humans? He asked. Does 
set you free. Free. Once men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free, but that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a man's mind, Paul quoted. Right out of the Butlerian Jihad in the Orange Catholic Bible, she said. But what the O.C. Bible should have said is, Thou shalt not make a machine to counterfeit a human mind. Have you studied the menta in your service? I've studied what's the fear I want. The Great Revolt took away a crutch, she said, and forced human minds to develop. Schools were started to train human talents. Many Jesuit schools, she nodded. We have two chief survivors of those ancient schools, the Penny Jesuit and the Spacing Guild. The Guild, so we think, emphasizes almost pure mathematics. Penny Jesuit performs another function. Politics, he said. Kobalad, the old woman said. She sent a hard glance at Jessica. I've not told him your reference, Jessica said. succeed. 